Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class, Chapter 2, Lecture, Part B. So now we're going to move on to some other key organelles found in the cytoplasm. The first we'll talk about is the ribosomes. Ribosomes are a two-part pr protein structure with a small subunit and a large subunit. They are found free-floating in the cytoplasm or bound to the endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the ribosomes do not have any sort of membrane structures associated with them. The function of the ribosomes is the site of protein synthesis. So ribosomes are key to the formation of proteins, which are key to the fun most functions of the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum, on the other hand, is a network of membranes that extend from the nuclear envelope. And there are two main types of endoplasmic reticulum. You have rough endoplasmic reticulum, which has ribosomes associated with it, and it's these ribosomes that give it its rough appearance. And then you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which obviously lacks ribosomes. Now, the key functions of the rough ER is to, synthesis, blah, is to synthesize glycoproteins and phospholipids. And obviously, the proteins are made by the ribosomes that then will insert the proteins directly into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Then you also have the smooth ER. Here, you, the structure synthesizes fatty acids and steroids. It also is involved in inactivating some harmful substances. And it can store calcium ions for muscle contractions in muscle cells. It turns out that with the smooth ER's uh, ability to break down certain substances, that there are some drugs that the smooth ER is key to breaking down, and that continued exposure to these drugs will lead to the liver cells, where this breakdown occurs, to increase the amount of smooth ER found in those cells. And this is what then leads to the drug resistance. Golgi complex. Golgi complex is basically a structure made up of a series of pancake-like shaped membranes. And I let you think of the Golgi complex as sort of the post office of the cell. So what happens is vesicles coming from usually the rough ER will fuse with the Golgi complex and further um, modifications to those proteins will occur and then finally the proteins will leave through the secretory vesicles. So here's just another example of that. The rough ER sends the proteins to the Golgi complex. Here they are modified further and then sent to various locations in the cell, hence the post office box idea. These proteins can be sent to the plasma membrane where the vesicle will fuse to the plasma membrane releasing those proteins into the extracellular fluid. They can be embedded in the membranes of the vesicle that when it fuses to the plasma membrane will then have provided the plasma membrane with additional integral proteins. Or the proteins formed can be sent to other structures inside the cell. Lysosomes. Lysosomes are basically specialized vesicles. They're involved in carrying out digestion of food-like particles, of invading microbes, whatever. I like to think of lysosomes as the cell's demolition crew. So some of the functions involve digesting substances that enter via endocytosis, which would include phagocytosis. Lysosomes also are involved in autophagy, which is the breakdown of organelles, which have become um, non-functional in some way, or the numbers are too many and they need to be broken, uh, decreased. It is also involved in implementing autolysis. This is the lysosomes destroying the cell itself. This often occurs when there's some sort of defect that has occurred in the cell, such as infection. And it is also could be involved in extracellular digestion, 
where the lysosome would fuse with the plasma membrane and release its digestive enzymes into the extracellular fluid. Now, there's an inherited condition called Tay Sachs disease, and it has been discovered that this disease is caused by the absence of a single lysosomal enzyme. So, with one enzyme missing from the plethora of digestive enzymes found in the lysosomes, a patient who is born with this condition will gradually become blind, demented, uncoordinated, and usually dies by age five. Peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are modified vesicle structures, much like lysosomes, but here they are filled with enzymes that fight free radicals and also break down poisons. So you can think of the um, peroxisomes as sort of the neutralizers of the cell, or maybe the hazmat of the cells. And peroxisomes are found to be the key structure also in the detoxification of alcohol in the liver. Proteasomes. Proteasomes, like ribosomes, are membrane-free structures. Proteasomes are very small, so you do not see them under the light microscope. And they are involved in the continual breakdown of cytosolic proteins, when these proteins are either unneeded, damaged, or faulty. Ongoing research has linked the failure of proteasomes to clear misfolded proteins with the accumulation of um, plaques in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So getting rid of unwanted proteins is really critical for a healthy organism. The next organelle, and my personal favorite, is the mitochondria. The mitochondria can be referred to as the powerhouse of the cell because it is here that ATP is produced in large amounts. And as I said before, ATP is the energy currency of the cell and is needed to perform uh, most functions in the cell that need additional energy. So the ATP is produced through a process called cellular respiration. It's called respiration because the oxygen that we breathe in is used here in the mitochondria to produce large amounts of ATP. Mitochondria also has a function in apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So while autolysis was destroying cells that have ceased to function properly, apoptosis is destroying cells that are no longer needed. So for instance, during uh, our embryological development, we had a period in which we had a small tail on our embryo body. And when that tail was determined to no longer be necessary, then those cells of that tail underwent apoptosis. The third principal part of most cells is the nucleus. As we said before, the nucleus is the largest organelle in the cell, and it houses the genetic information, or DNA, of that organism. Some of the various parts of the nucleus include the nuclear envelope, which is a two-layer membrane structure. And embedded in the nuclear envelope are nuclear pores, which end up forming open channels that are very large and allow large molecules, such as RNA, to pass through. Within the nuclear envelope is the DNA. However, DNA isn't naked inside the uh, nucleus. Instead, it is bound to proteins, and this relaxed structure is referred to as chromatin. So chromatin is DNA protein complexes in a relaxed state inside the nucleus. Another structure found within the nucleus is the nucleolus, and it is here in the nucleolus that ribosomes are made. Another thing to point out is that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is basically an extension of the nuclear envelope. So as I stated already, chromatin and is composed of DNA and proteins and complex together. So the DNA by itself looks like a double helix, which is basically like taking a ladder and sort of twisting it. And this holds information in small packets that are called genes. So certain portions of the DNA's chain 
has genes in it that will then lead to the production of subunits of spe specific proteins. Now, DNA can't be left naked because we want it to be easily accessible and if it's all by itself, it's such a thin little thread that it could form big old knots and become inaccessible. So, the protein is, uh, the DNA is associated with proteins, specifically histones, that help it um, packed down in a planned and organized manner. So DNA and histones from chromatin, which can then further fold into chromatin fiber, which you will find in most cells when the DNA is in a relaxed state. However, there are certain times in, in a cell's life when that chromatin fiber will further condense down into a, a structure we refer to as the chromosome. Usually this chromosome is depicted as sort of an X shape, where you have two sister chromatids connected at the centromere. Each sister chromatin is a complete copy of that chromosome, so you have two copies in this one chromosome. And here's just an uh, electron microscope view of the chromosome, and you can see, yes indeed, many chromosomes look like X's, with the two sister chromatids connected at the centromere. So, humans, how many chromosomes do humans have? They have, we have 46 chromosomes. And these are found in pairs. So that means we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and therefore are referred to as diploid. Diploid, two copies of each chromosome. And here is a human karyotype. So basically a cell that was has entered a state where chromosomes are formed, has been squashed, and the chromosomes have been separated through uh, basically taking a picture of the squash cell <laughs> and then uh, magnifying that picture. And then the chromosomes are paired up. So you have chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., all the way to chromosome 22. And these are, but then chromosome 23 is special. It's often referred to as the sex chromosome because this is often used to determine the gender of a cell or a person. So in this case, we have an X and a Y, so this would be the karyotype of a male. If we had instead two Xs, it would be the karyotype of a female. And that's it for this portion of the lecture.